Another driver without a Grand Prix seat is Jonathan Palmer, but he's going to be telling us about the problems drivers face at this year's circuits. The way these cars stop may look undramatic, but for the driver it's the most violent part of racing, accidents aside. When he stamps on the brake pedal, he'll experience four times as much force, three and a half G, as the best family cars performing an emergency stop. To put that in perspective, 180 miles per hour to zero takes just four next training seconds, the time needed by a family car to stop from a mere 60. Is it any wonder, therefore, that without this full harness seatbelt, he'd be instantly thrown forward out of his seat? There are two reasons for this phenomenal stopping ability. Firstly, the cars have a vast amount of sheer grip. These enormous slick tyres biting the road even better because they're being pressed hard into the ground by around two tonnes of aerodynamic downforce. And of course, secondly, immensely powerful brakes have to be used to take full advantage of all this grip. The pedal itself is tailored to suit the driver's foot, while a cockpit adjustable brake balance control helps him prevent the front or rear wheel skidding. The brake discs and pads are made of carbon fibre, being lighter and biting better than conventional steel. Operating at 400 degrees C, they glow red hot and these big air scoops are vital for cooling. What makes life hard for brakes is frequent heavy use in hot temperatures, and at Phoenix we have exactly that. Problems can result from overheating or simply worn out brakes, although with no power assistance, even if the car doesn't wilt, the driver's foot very well might. Drivers' tempers rise about as fast as their temperature gauges as they pray their engines won't overheat. These days they're not the only ones who can worry about their engine temperature. In several teams, the information is radioed to the pits too. They aim to keep the water temperature at about 90 degrees C, and this is adjusted during practice. If it stays that way, that's fine, but all too often on this sort of circuit, little pieces of debris, usually tyre rubber, progressively accumulate and partially blank off the radiators. Above 110 degrees, and the driver will notice a power drop off. Over 120 though, and unless he makes a quick pit stop to unclog the radiators, he'll be walking home. So. Imola is a power circuit where all-out speed really matters, as Jonathan Palmer explains. Of course, racing cars are expected to accelerate quickly to a high top speed, a quality that's of particular importance at Imola with its slow chicanes and long straights. Acceleration is all about power-to-weight ratio. The greater the power and less the weight, the faster a car will accelerate. So with six times the power and only half the weight, a Formula One car accelerates 12 times as fast as a family saloon. To put that in perspective, consider the vast difference in performance between a basic Mini and a top-notch Porsche. Well, in fact, the Porsche only accelerates three times as fast as the Mini. So clearly this means some pretty impressive performance figures. The standard yardstick, 0 to 60, takes about 10 seconds in a good family car. In the Formula One, around 2 seconds. Though even this is hindered by the wheel spin that occurs all the way up to 80 miles per hour when the car's still in first gear. Perhaps most impressive is 0 to 150 miles per hour in just 8 seconds, the time our family car needs to reach a mere 50. As the cars cross the start-finish line at Imola, they are doing about 150 miles per hour, still in fourth gear, with fifth and sixth still to be used around the flat-out left-hander, before hitting a maximum of 195 miles per hour, a typical top speed for faster circuits. So, while the older V8 engines can still be on the pace at slow circuits, as a lazy demonstrated at Phoenix, at a fast track like Imola, we should see the hard-sounding V10s of Honda and Renault and the wailing Ferrari V12 dominate the race with their superior power. So, what matters at Monaco as far as the car is concerned? Everything, but especially handling and getting the best setup. Jonathan Palmer. 18 corners in two miles makes Monaco the most tortuous circuit on the Grand Prix calendar. Indeed, corners such as the Lowe's Hairpin and Raskas are so tight that a driver can actually run out of lock if he takes the wrong line, resulting in a three-point turn. The ability to flick the wheel from lock to lock is therefore most important. Each driver develops his own individual designer steering wheel, recorded in minute detail by the manufacturer. Of course, all wheels are small by family car standards, though drivers are often forced to use a smaller steering wheel than they would like, just so that it can fit in today's tiny cockpits. Even so, lack of room for knuckles and arms can still be compromising, and several drivers use steering wheels with the bottom flattened to provide leg clearance. 
quick release mechanisms are also needed to ease entry and exit. So if you see a driver throwing the steering wheel away from his crashed car, it didn't brake, he's just getting out. Unlike driving on the road, it's impossible to feed the wheel through your hands, so it remains tightly held at the 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock position. The cars therefore have ultra-responsive steering. Small movements of the wheel cause large changes in front wheel angle. And while this is essential for rapid changes of direction, it makes the cars very nervous and twitchy, as well as heavy to drive. The steering's lightest at low speeds, for as the speed builds up, so does the downforce. And at 150 miles an hour, these cars effectively weigh over two tonnes. Just imagine driving a heavy van with this tiny steering wheel, with one foot wide front tyres, and no power steering. Exactly, mighty heavy. Another reason why the drivers need to be fit. Happily, today's Canadian Grand Prix looks as though it could stay dry, but, wet or dry, fuel consumption could be a problem, as Jonathan Palmer explains. Formula One drivers and family motorists alike take for granted the vast amount of research and development that goes into improving the fuels they use. Grand Prix cars also run on petrol, a bit better than the old Five Star, and teams have the option of several different blends. Some better for performance, others for economy, and unleaded can also be used. It's where to put this fuel that provides a major headache for the chassis designers. A tiny Formula One car must accommodate the full race requirement of 45 gallons now that refuelling stops are no longer permitted, whereas a family car needs only to carry a quarter of this. Safety is of paramount importance. The tank itself is made of five layers of rubber and Kevlar and is situated right in the centre of the car between the driver and the engine bay with the old side extensions that used to wrap around the driver now banned following Berger's fiery accident at Imola last year. Like the family motorist, the Formula One driver also has a fuel gauge, but one so accurate he can tell his consumption a mere four and a half miles per gallon to the last cc, and if it's too high he can adjust the mixture setting of his engine. Normally though, it's the boffins in the pits, surrounded by computers who monitor fuel consumption and signal any changes required to the driver. High fuel consumption only hurts the pocket of the family motorist. To the Formula One driver, it can mean running out of fuel and perhaps losing the world championship. The 2.7 mile circuit is bumpy and very high. Jonathan Palmer. Being 7,000 feet above sea level makes the Mexico circuit quite different from the rest of the Grand Prix calendar with regard to the way the cars perform. The fundamental difference, of course, is that the air is around 25% thinner which affects the engines, the aerodynamics, and even the drivers. It may seem odd to talk of a Formula One car feeling gutless and slow, but that's just what they feel like to the drivers in Mexico. The power an engine develops is proportional to the amount of oxygen it can burn. So with 25% less oxygen, the Formula One engines produce 25% less power. Despite this power reduction, the top speed at Mexico is as high as anywhere. Although power is down, so is aerodynamic drag and the cars can carve through the thinner air with less wind resistance. If the speeds are up on the straights, they certainly aren't on the corners. Now the thinner air is a disadvantage, for the downforce the front and rear wings can produce is reduced, as there is less mass of air pressing on them. Just to compound the grip problem, the unstable ground of Mexico City causes the track surface to be bumpier than any. Spare a thought for the drivers, too. Like any athlete competing at high altitudes, he'll be breathing hard in response to the lack of oxygen for his lungs, and without the opportunity to acclimatise for a few weeks beforehand, he'll certainly appreciate the rest as he flies down the main straight at 195 miles per hour. In Mexico, the correct choice of tyre was critical, as Ayrton Senna found out. And here, in France, tyres are going to be very important too, as Jonathan Palmer explains. With fronts 13 inches wide and rears 18 inches, these Formula One tyres are clearly vast compared with this from a family car. But first, just in case you've always wondered, these slick tyres, as used in dry conditions, are bald because tread is only required for water drainage. These are the wet weather tyres. It's not just the size that provides the phenomenal grip. The rubber itself is relatively soft and therefore sticky. The softer this rubber mix, the compound, the more grip the tyre will have, but the trade-off is that it will not last as well, with the extreme being super-grippy qualifying tyres designed to last just one blistering three-mile lap. 
vital for a grid time, but expensive at £1,000 a set. In contrast, in order for the race tyres to last 200 miles, the compound must be much harder, with a consequent loss of grip, perhaps two to three seconds a lap. The tyre companies, though, bring over 4,000 tyres to each Grand Prix, in various different compounds, and each team has to assess its own optimum tyre. No easy task. Teams can decide whether to run one set of hard tyres throughout or two sets of faster, softer tyres, which will require a time-consuming pit stop when they lose grip. And even though the tyre change itself can be lightning fast, a further 20 seconds is normally lost entering and leaving the pits. The tyre's role, though, is more than just providing grip. Running at a very high temperature, 110 centigrade, and a relatively low pressure, 18 psi, they also act as an important spring. Indeed, most of the visible car movement comes not from flexing springs, but from squashing tyres. The old abrasive Paul Ricard circuit was a real tyre eater. Now, with a new smooth surface, no one can be sure how the tyres will perform. In Formula One, weight is very important as Jonathan Palmer explains. When a Formula One car designer plans a new car, it's imperative that he keeps the weight right down to the 500 kilo regulation minimum. That's less than the weight of a Mini. An overweight car is not just slow on acceleration. It also takes longer to stop, and most importantly, can't corner as fast. Vital at Silverstone with its awe-inspiring 165 mile per hour stow and club corner. Teams have a yardstick for this basic rule of Formula One physics. Every 40 kilos costs one second per lap. This handicap is best displayed when the fuel tank is filled for the start of the race with around 45 gallons of petrol, increasing the car's weight by one third. To the driver, it's like piling five adults into a family car and loading the roof rack. One of the keys to weight reduction is extensive use of this magic material, carbon fibre, which enables the chassis, wings, bodywork and many other components to be made as strong as steel yet for just one-fifth the weight. These front wings, for example, can support half a ton, yet weigh just a couple of kilos. The cars are weighed after the race, but are also checked at random as they come into the pits during qualifying, when the driver's weight is deducted. For unlike horse racing, light drivers don't have to carry ballast, so they're at an advantage. All of which means that poor old Nigel Mansell, weighing nearly 20 kilos more than teammate Alan Frost, must drive his Ferrari half a second a lap faster just to keep up. Well, time will tell. But here at today's German Grand Prix, the requirement of paramount importance is power. Power allied to a well-set-up car and transmitted through an efficient gearbox. Jonathan Palmer. With its slow second-gear chicanes and 200 mile per hour straights, the gearbox is going to get worked particularly hard at Hockenheim. Unlike a family car, the gear lever itself is on the right-hand side, with only tiny movements required when changing gear, largely because of lack of space. The car has six gears, arranged like a five-speed road car, but with six straight back from fifth. In contrast, though, there is no synchromesh. It's like the old crash gearbox, and while that means the engine must be revved up to change down, gear changes are lightning fast. Movement from the gear lever is transferred down this shaft to the gearbox itself, situated between the engine and the back axle. Although much smaller and lighter than that of a family car, the main difference is that the gear cogs themselves can be changed individually. The maximum speed of the Formula One car in each gear is mighty impressive. At Hockenheim, that means spreading from 85 miles per hour in first to 200 in sixth. So when Murray talks about a second gear corner, that means around 100 miles per hour. Every circuit demands different top speeds in each gear, and this is achieved by changing the actual gear cogs, known as ratios. Everything we've talked about so far applies to every Grand Prix car except one, and that, of course, is the revolutionary Ferrari. With its semi-automatic, seven-speed gearbox, gear selection is electronically controlled, flicking this lever on the right-hand side to change up, and this on the left to change down. An ingenious system, it allows both hands to be kept on the wheel, an advantage other teams are looking at carefully. Race, it's not an all-McLaren front row. It's an all-Williams front row, with Belgian Thierry Boutsen occupying his first-ever pole position. At the Hungaro ring, 
superb handling is the name of the game, and that means superb suspension. Jonathan Palmer. As with your own family car, suspension is required on Grand Prix cars to cope with bumps, something the Hungara ring circuit has, by racetrack standards, in abundance. The basic components are the same. Springs to absorb the bumps, dampers to stop the car continuing to bounce, together with anti-roll bars to keep the car flat on cornering. Don't get confused, by the way, with this, the protective roll-over bar, which every driver hopes he'll never need. Any suspension system must compromise between being soft and supple to provide a comfortable ride and being hard to sharpen steering response and provide optimum cornering grip. Clearly a Grand Prix car is totally designed for performance, hence the very harsh, jerky ride so obvious from the cockpit. This is achieved by using immensely stiff springs, designed to allow just millimetres of movement before the car hits the ground when sparks fly from the skid blocks. The length and position of these links, the wishbones, are carefully designed to keep the tyre flat on the ground at all times. The springs themselves are tucked in out of the airstream and the full weight of the car is taken by this tiny rod. The relative stiffness of the suspension front to rear is critical to the way a car behaves at the cornering limit and mechanics are often changing front and rear springs during practice sessions. So vital is it to maintain this balance throughout the race that the driver can even adjust the front suspension from the cockpit. Conventional metal springs are currently used by all, though with computerised active suspensions being developed by most top teams, their days are surely numbered. Everyone's going to have a busy time on the world's finest Grand Prix circuit, including keeping a careful eye on their instruments. Jonathan Palmer. The old days of a dashboard full of instruments for the driver to check are long gone. The sheer speed of the cars means that there is minimal time for the driver to look at anything, while space is also at a premium as cars get ever slimmer. But perhaps most important of all, modern electronics allow the bulk of engine monitoring now to be done in the pit. There will never be a substitute for the rev counter though. Its shape may have developed, but it's as important to the driver as the speedometer is to the family motorist. The limit he mustn't break is that of the maximum engine rev usually well over 12,000 RPM. Indeed, the rev counter scale doesn't even start until 7,000, just above idle, when many family cars would already have blown up. He has other displays too, water and oil temperature, oil and fuel pressure, but it's in the pit now where the careful monitoring takes place by telemetry. Information is radioed from the car and displayed on a daunting bank of screens and computers manned by a team of technicians. As well as displaying all the information the driver has, much more is recorded, even down to an analysis of exhaust gases and throttle position, the ultimate spy in the cab. Fortunately, there's still a role for that cleverest of communication systems, the human voice. On pushing the steering wheel mounted button, the driver can express his feelings to the pit by radio, so sound quality can be variable, which is sometimes just as well. As ever, there was lots of spectacular action here in qualifying, especially for Stefano Modena, who understandably lost control of his Brabham when its engine suddenly lost power. And power is the thing that matters more than anything else at Monza. Jonathan Palmer. However important the other components might be, the heart of a Grand Prix car is its engine. Its regulated maximum capacity is 3.5 litres, about twice the size of that of an average family car. Yet it produces seven times as much power, close to 700 horsepower, even though turbos are banned. As well as providing the power, the engine also forms a vital part of the structure of the car, being all that holds the gearbox with its rear suspension onto the back of the carbon fibre chassis. The number of cylinders varies. Here the Honda has ten, arranged as with the Moore in a V of two banks. The Renault in the Williams also has ten, so the shrill sounding Ferrari has twelve, and the other end of the range is a compact Ford V8 that powers the Benetton. As you might expect, the engines are computer controlled with complex electronic management systems for the fuel injection and ignition, which helps them rev round to a dizzy 13,000 RPM. Despite all this technology, the driver still cannot start his own car, the considerable weight of a starter motor being left to a mechanic to plug in. But the teams pay a high price for all this performance. With engines only lasting one 200-mile race, they can take up to 10 spare units with them to a Grand Prix. 
In fact, half the budget is spent on engines, but then, as Monza shows, better than anywhere, horsepower is vital. There was certainly a lot going on in Derek's cockpit at Monza, but then it's the driver's office. Jonathan Palmer. At first sight, you wouldn't even think there's room to fit in a Grand Prix car cockpit, let alone race from it, for the designers are constantly striving to reduce its size in the quest for performance. Situated in the centre of this immensely strong carbon fibre survival cell chassis, the seat is individually moulded to each driver's body shape. Despite appearances, it's actually very comfortable, providing tremendous support, particularly when this six-point seatbelt is tightened to pin the body back into it. Having made his seat, the driver then decides exactly where he wants the steering wheel, and the column is made to suit. The gear lever and other controls for the anti-roll bar and brake balance, together with switches including ignition, fuel pump, rear light and fire extinguisher, take up what little space is left. Visibility is an important consideration. The driver actually looks over this screen rather than through it, and its height is varied for different circuits high on fast ones to reduce cockpit wind turbulence and low at slow tracks to improve visibility. Mirrors too need to be carefully positioned to find a clear path through the complex rear wings. Moving forward, the cars have three pedals, accelerator, brake and clutch, just like a family car, but arranged much closer together, again because of lack of space. To accommodate drivers of different leg length, the pedals can be adjusted fore and aft though safety regulations state they must not be ahead of the front axle line. Quite a problem for tall drivers like Gerhard Berger. It really is a small man's world. Everyone's been setting their cars up in an effort to get the maximum benefits from two things that matter a great deal on the Haref circuit. Aerodynamics and downforce. Jonathan Palmer. Although hard to appreciate from television, Grand Prix car cornering speeds are staggeringly high, around 150 miles per hour, for example, at Jerez's faster corners, ones that would have a family car struggling at 70. While suspension and tyres are important, it's aerodynamic downforce that's of most influence in providing the cars with such tremendous grip. As an aeroplane cuts through the air, its wings cause it to lift up. A Grand Prix car is designed to do the opposite and the faster it goes, the more the flow of the air over the front and rear wings causes it to be pushed hard into the track, vastly increasing its grip. In fact, the whole car contributes, particularly the underside, hence this complex rear exit diffuser. However, you don't get this valuable effect for nothing. The more downforce a car produces, the more wind resistance it has, and this restricts top speed. With no wings, a Grand Prix car might top 230 miles per hour, but it will be very slow around the corners, so a compromise must be reached, for the wings may not be adjusted on the move. A tight, twisty circuit like Hureth demands maximum cornering grip for the best lap time, so the cars run with very large wings, effectively increasing their weight from half a tonne at rest to two tonnes at 150 miles per hour. It's vital that this force, and therefore grip, should be balanced front to rear, and the front wing angle can be adjusted to achieve this. The main reason for the high level of fitness required to drive a Grand Prix car is because of these phenomenal cornering forces, up to 4G. Muscles build up over many seasons racing to cope with this, and indeed, if any of you had the chance to drive one, you'd last about three laps before you just couldn't hold your head up anymore.